Praise the Lord. What a morning. Let's all be upstanding. Thank you, Jesus. Every hand lifted up to the Lord this morning. Let's all of us look to Him. I hope you came today to hear what He has to say to you. I believe as well as God disciplines us and as well as God corrects us, but there's a lot of encouragement by the Spirit of God to do what is right as a believer and as a follower of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. We all want to do better. We all want to grow in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. We all want to glorify the name of the Lord our God. Voice of the Nations Church, you are here to be a voice to the nations and you are here to make a difference in a world that the Lord has placed you. I pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that today the Holy Spirit will give us ears to hear and hearts to receive. We don't want to miss out on not one word what he is saying to us today. Lord, prepare our hearts today to receive the seed of the word of God in the mighty name of Jesus. Anoint your servant, Father God, so the word that comes out of my mouth is the anointed word of the living God, so it can give life to the hearer and also a blessing to everyone that would receive and welcome the word of God. In the name of Jesus, we pray and we give God the glory and God's people say, Amen. Come on, give him all the praise. God bless you. Please take your seats. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Under the title of Count the Cost, we're going to continue the series that we are talking about to <clears throat> get us ready to whenever we face difficulties, whenever we face hardships, that we don't say, oh, what's happening to me? We say, I'm ready for that. I knew exactly what, what, what it was all about before I actually surrender my life to Jesus. So let me open with um, something that I read um, this week. And it says, hardship. Hardship often prepares an ordinary person like you and me ordinary people like you and me, hardship, not the good times, not the great times, but the hard times. Hardship often prepares an ordinary person for an extraordinary destiny. How many of you look forward for an extraordinary destiny? A destiny that's with, filled with God, a destiny that's full of the Holy Spirit. Hardship prepares you, not the good time. Don't com complain about the season you are in. God put you in that season for a reason. Nothing happened without preparation. And if you ever think that you're going to be ready for God without preparation, it doesn't happen. Right? You don't eat a good meal and it doesn't take you at least a couple of hours, ask me, two o'clock in the morning, you're still in the kitchen, to prepare something that's going to be nice. Preparation. Preparation goes always ahead of having a great meal, having a great life. A life that testifies of the power and the greatness of God. If you think you're gonna, your life is going to testify about the greatness of God without your life being prepared through hardships, you have something else. Your, your, your expectation will be wrong because you're not going to get that. You want to live a great life? There is a price to pay to live a great life. There is a price to pay if you want to live a great life. Let me say it again. What prepares us? Hardships. Hardships prepares an ordinary person. An ordinary person like you and me, it pre pre prepares us for an extraordinary destiny. An extraordinary destiny is what God has in mind and in heart 
for his body or for the family of God. It's his will for you to live a great life. But that great life, it doesn't come cheap or easy. Your only easy is he's with you. That's the only easy thing that I can think of that I know that no matter what I'm going through, he never left my side. He's always with me. He is helping me. That's what makes life easy or looking forward to life is having and knowing that he is with me to help me through it. But what I don't understand is whatever I'm going through is actually preparing me for something bigger and greater. Hardship does that. Hardship prepares an ordinary person like you and me to an extraordinary destiny in God. And that's something to look forward to. It's not how we start. It's how we continue, it's how we stay, it's how we finish the race that has for us. Unfortunately, um, I've read some of the lives of great men, great men of God that have been used by God greatly, but towards the end of their journey, they failed big time. So don't think you're strong and mighty. Don't think it doesn't happen to me. It happens to every one of us, every one of us. So we should, we should understand and keep our eyes on the prize, the finished line, the finished line. So let me begin, and if you can put out for me, please, first, first Peter chapter four, I want to start with this one first, first Peter chapter four. Remember, hardship prepares you. Hardship prepares you to have a great destiny. Great life comes with a great price. You can write that down and go home and meditate on it. Great life comes with a great price and a great sacrifice. Sacrificial life is what it takes to have a great life. You cannot be selfish and have a great life. It cannot make life about you and still enjoy and have a great life. Your perspective has to change. Your ideas and your thoughts have to change. The way to greatness is the cross. You want to live a great life? The cross is the way. So please, let, put that put out for me. First Peter chapter 4 and from verse 12. First Peter 4, 12. Beloved, do not be amazed and bewildered at the fiery ordeal which is taking place to test your quality. Number one, things happen to actually to test our quality, what we are made of. I was saying in the prayer, prayer this morning, I was saying to the group we are praying, I said, people say, I'm like this because I've been going through hard time. Or I am like that because I, what, with what I'm been going through. And it's all the lies of the enemy to make you believe that. What you are going through, it's only to test your quality. See, if, if you say, I am like this because of my circumstances, it's wrong because your circumstances revealed you. Yeah? Your circumstances only revealed the real you because the real us will not show until you go through certain things in life. And so fiery ordeal or testing times or, or, or hard times, it only taking place to test you what you are made of. People say, I'm offended and I go. I'm offended and I go and I leave and I go. Well, who brought you to the faith? 
who opened your heart, who gave you life, who died for you. Did people do that? Did people do that? No, people didn't do that. Who did that? You're walking away from a will of God, from the one that actually loves you and gave his life for you. You see, this is the quality that God is trying to show you what you are actually made of. And so he allows certain things to happen to us because he wants to test the quality of our faith Everything you do for God is going to be tested by fire. Your service for God is going to be tested. Do you know how many people quit serving God because it gets hard? Who am I talking to this morning? Do you know how many people walk away and let go because it gets hard? So what are you made of? What makes you quit very quickly? What makes you give up? What makes you? Do you think when Jesus endured the cross, that was an easy decision to endure the cross? Do you think, have you gone and prayed until your sweat broke out like blood? Have you done that? Of course you haven't done that. Why? Because Jesus was resisting sin. How was he resisting sin? He was resisting sin in prayer. Some of you want to fight sin and you go exactly, exactly the opposite direction to what Jesus did. How did Jesus fought even the thought of, Lord, if it's not your will, take that cup from me. How can I take that cup? How did he fight it? He fought it in prayer. And that's the price that oftentimes comes. We get offended at a very little thing without going and fighting in prayer in the spirit. And oftentimes you hear people arguing with God, it's, as, it's, it's his fault. I'm offended at God. Hello. Go read your Bible. Go read your Bible. How can you be offended at a God that did everything, including laying down his own life to save you? How are you going to be offended at God? You know, I've been praying and not answering. Maybe you're not learning the lesson that he wants you to learn. Don't be amazed and bewildered. What's happening to me? Instead of saying, I don't understand what's happening to me, but I know I'm here for a reason. And I'm here to learn from the Holy Spirit himself, why am I in that situation, what it demands for me to lay down my life completely. Is it easy? I never said it's easy. But it's easier than you rebelling against God. With all the pain and the suffering that you go through as a believer in Jesus Christ, to stay in the will of God is far easier than you rebelling and going out there and doing what you want because somebody hurt your feelings. If somebody hurt your feelings, that's a message from God to you to say, get over yourself. Hello? Two people smiled and the rest didn't. Get over yourself. You don't think they hurt Jesus' feeling? You don't think when they spit in his face? And yet on the cross, Father, forgive him? Is that, is that, what's that? Do I have that inside of me? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. I have that very same spirit that that caused Jesus to live in such a way and die in such a way. I have that same spirit inside of me. Somebody offended you? That means get over self. Self is still on the throne. You cannot offend a dead person. I dare you. Go to a corpse, a body, and then swear at them and... 
Do whatever you want at them. See their response. How do they respond? No response. No response. And then we say, oh, I'm dead to self. And if somebody said a word, oh my God, hell break loose. And then I tell everybody how bad that person treated me. And I'll get into that self-defense mode. But I'm dead with Christ. No, you're not. You're absolutely not. You're still alive. And those feelings and emotions are still playing the game. And you're allowing the enemy to do that. Because I haven't learned to stand in faith and walk in the love of God. How many times can your brother sin against you and forgive? Seven times. And Jesus said, I won't say seven. I would say 70 times seven. He wants to really finish you off. Get you out of the way. Okay, I can do it once. I can do it twice. But how many times? 70 times seven. When you reach the 490 times a day, then you can say something about it. Disciples of Jesus, you really need to be a disciple. And you really need to be disciplined through the word of God. Discipleships is not going around and saying, I'm a disciple of Jesus. A disciple of Jesus is a have, have their life laid down for the cause of the gospel. That's a disciple of Jesus. Everything that happens to us is to test our qualities and to show us, not show somebody else, where actually I am at. Where am I at? And so it says, as though something strange or unusual and alien to you and your position were befalling you. This is not strange. Keep going, please. But insofar as you are sharing Christ's sufferings, oh, wait, wait. Wow, we share Christ's suffering. I thought we share his glory. I thought we share his resurrection power. But I've never meditated on sharing Christ's suffering. What did he do to suffer? Absolutely nothing. His obedience to God caused the world to attack him and rebel against what he was doing. He said, all I told you is the truth. All I told you is the truth. Now, how can you be attacked by people when you are telling the truth? How? How does that happen? How do you get attacked by people by telling the truth? And the Bible tells us very clearly that if you're truly a disciple of Jesus and you speak the truth in love, you will suffer. There's a price to pay. It's, it's easy to compromise and it's easy to justify your condition and situation. But there's a price to pay as a follower of Jesus Christ. We share in Christ suffering. Suffering not because we are living in sin. There's two kinds of suffering. I said it before and I say it again. Choose one of them. Okay? You suffer when you are outside the will of God but you also suffer when you are in the will of God. Now, that kind of suffering, the second kind of suffering, is what you and I are called to. The suffering of Christ. For living right, for doing the right thing, for walking in love, for ob obeying God, you suffer. You suffer from people who are around you who don't want or threaten by your life. There's a suffering. There's a suffering. But in so far as you are sharing Christ's suffering, rejoice. At the same time, at the same time there's a suffering and there's also rejoicing. I rejoice because I didn't do anything to cause that to happen. But that tells me that because I am in the will of God and my master suffered for doing what is right, this is what I'm going through now. That's not going to cause me to hate people. That's not going to cause me to leave ministry. That's not going to cause me to walk away from the call of God because it gets tough and rough and hard. I am called to endure hardships. Did you hear me? 
I am called to endure hardships. Okay. I, I, give me another verse, and then we go back to that. We don't usually go back to that, but give me another verse um, that, that goes along with what we are talking about here. Uh, in First Peter chapter 2, please, from verse 18. Just to prove what we are talking about here. First Peter 2, verse 18. You who are household servants, be submissive to your masters with all proper respect. Not only to those who are kind and considerate and reasonable. If that's your boss, if that's the master that you work under, the Bible tells us, even if that master wasn't a good person, the Bible tells us for me as a believer, we should be submissive to the masters. Don't talk against them. Don't point the finger at them. Don't attack them. Right? With all proper respect, even if someone is not obeying God, you treat those above you with a proper respect. Don't justify your bad actions. Don't justify your wrong words that's coming out. It says, that's, that's how you kill the flesh anyway. How do you think you're going to kill the flesh? You kill it by not feeding it or by not giving it what it wants. And that's why Jesus said, not everybody can be my disciple. If you're talking about discipleship, you're talking about a life that is totally, completely dead to self and pick up, pick up your cross and follow Jesus. Be submissive to your master with all proper respect, not only to those who are kind and considerate and reasonable, but also to those who are surely overbearing, unjust, and keep going, keep going, please, and crooked. Respect them. What? Well, respect the crook? Not because of them, but because of you. Did you hear me? Not because of them, it's because of you. Your testimony is, I'm a believer. They don't know, but you know. And this is a living testimony about you, not about them. Everything that happens in your life, it's never about the person in your life. It's always about you. God is speaking to you. So why should I submit to a person that is bad? And It's all about you. It shows who you are. Never mind who they are. But it shows who you are. You show your true color in any situation you are put in. They made me swear. That ma they made me lie. They made me. No, nobody made you. God is showing you where you are at. Work on yourself. You can't work on somebody else. We're forever trying to change people. And God says, forget that. Forget that. Let's, let's go through with you first. Pastor John said it a few weeks ago. Before you take the speck out of your brother's eye, take the beam out of your own eyes. So it's never about what that person is bad, treating you bad. It's about how you're responding to that person that shows who you are. Are we listening? Is that okay? Yeah. Can I keep going? Yeah. Okay. Praise the Lord. For one is regarded favorably, is approved, acceptable, and thankworthy if, as in the sight of God, he endures the pain of unjust suffering. What do you mean, Lord? What do you mean? Enduring the pain of unjust suffering. Is there a suffering as unjust? Yes! Jesus suffered the unjust sufferings. And here you want to fight 
Because you are in the right and they are in the wrong. And God says, let it go. Show who you are. After all, you say, I'm a disciple of Jesus. It's not a word, I'm a disciple. It's a life that proves your discipleship. Discipleship is not about taking lessons on discipleship. I can tell you, I can remember one person that went and studied counseling, and that person is as far as the east is from the west to be a counselor, but she's got a certificate. <laughs> Getting a certificate doesn't make you a counselor. People gave you the certificate, let God qualifies you. Let God qualifies you. Let God says you are fit to be a counselor. Because of your life experience and what you've been through. And how you allowed God to change you. And how you allowed the Holy Spirit to kill the flesh and the desires of the flesh on a daily basis. This is not something you do one day. This is something that you do every day. Because every day the devil's going to wake up. And put you through something. Why did he, what did he say? To test your quality. God allows it to test your quality. And it says here, for one is regarded favorably, is approved, accepted, and thankworthy, if, as in the sight of God, he endures the pain of unjust suffering. Keep going, please. After all, what kind of glory is there in it? If, when you do wrong and are punished for it, so when you do wrong, you're going to receive punishment. So what glory is, what kind of glory you're going to get if you got what you deserve? Somebody was put in jail because of murder, because of stealing, because of this. So that's what they deserve. They did that. And if you do this, this is the result. But if you didn't do anything and you get thrown in jail, if you didn't do anything and you got beaten and then they put you, you read Acts 16 for preaching the gospel. Somebody came and they, you know, put their feet and hands in stock and they put them in the dungeon and, and they were bleeding in the dungeon for something that they did not deserve. Only the criminal are put in prison, not the innocent. Only the criminal deserve to die on the cross. And this is what they said to Jesus. Or Jesus even said that, uh, you know, uh, to the Jews, it was a curse. Any person that will hang on a tree is a curse. But why was Jesus hanging on that tree? Can I ask, why was Jesus hanging on a tree? What, what did he do to, what curse did he you know, operated on what, what is it that they were legally put him on that cross because it was illegal for him to go on the cross because he never did anything wrong. Why am I persecuted? Did I do anything wrong? Did I open the door? Well, no. So it's unjust. It's called suffering. It's called suffering when you are, didn't do anything and you're going through something. And then you bear it and you endure it and you don't run away from it. You don't run away from it. And so, what glory, what kind of glory is there in it when you do wrong? There's no glory when you do wrong and you suffer for the wrong that you've done. There's no glory in that. Right? When you do wrong and are punished for it. And you take it patiently. But if you bear patiently with suffering, which result when you do right. Wait a minute. So if I do wrong, I suffer. <laughs> and if I do right, I suffer. Right? If I do wrong, I suffer. We just read it. What kind of a glory that is if I do the wrong thing and get punished for it and take it patiently. Right? But then if you bear patiently with suffering which results when you do right and that is undeserved. 
So Jesus did that. He suffered and did not deserve the suffering and did not deserve the cross and did not deserve to die and did not deserve to be spit on and all the other things that was done. What kind of murder did he commit to, for them to treat him that way? There was no reason except he loves you. That's his reason. I love you. I love you so much that I'm willing to take anything and everything to make sure you come to me and you are saved through me. And I've set the example for you. There's no Christianity without suffering. I mean suffering unlawfully. I'm not talking about suffering. Unlawfully. You didn't do anything to suffer. What did he do to put, be put in jail and be, had many stripes? Nothing. Preaching the gospel. What did he do in, in prison? Well, unlike what many of us would do when we are facing problems and troubles. What did he do? Praising and praying. Praising and praying. Praising and praying, which will, would, did result in Heaven was open as Norma was saying to us what the Lord showed her in the, in the, in, in, in the Friday meeting or in the night prayer meeting. I don't remember now that heaven above us, above us open and be, it's not beyond our reach. It's like we can reach heaven. Heaven was open above them through prayer and praises and God sent the power and then shook the very prison and opened the door. God is on your side even when you are suffering for what is right. Are you hearing me? Are you hearing me? He's not going to spare you of what you're going to go through. But whatever you're going to go through, it's not going to kill you. Except the flesh. Well, I'm not ready for that. Well, you're not ready to be a disciple. Count the cost. Count the cost. You know, I put up with all this nonsense and people that will always attack me. Count the cost. You're not going to make it without it. There's no discipleship without suffering and pain. There's no discipleship without death totally to self. There's no discipleship without the cross. There's no discipleship without death. You can never be a disciple. Jesus said that. I'm not telling you that. He said, if you're not willing to take up your cross and lay down your life, you cannot be. You cannot be my disciple. Because if you want to be my disciple, that's what is required. And you didn't count the cost, so you're not going to make it. You're going to quit halfway because you started something in not knowing what it is. And the first hiccup you get as a follower of Jesus Christ, oh, what is this, all this Christianity? I'm out of that. I'm out. And I'm out. And you make your way out without actually understanding that what you are going through is the price that's demanded by God for you to pay. I want to have a great life. That's the way to greatness. I want to see miracles. That's the way to miracles. That's the way to the anointing. That's the way to the presence of God. That's the way to the power of God. It's not going to come cheap. And it's not going to come for you fighting for yourself. It won't happen. It won't happen. And may God have mercy on us. We might make it in the end. Maybe. I don't know. I'm not God and I don't know. I don't know. So, but if you bear patiently with suffering, which results when you do right, and that is undeserved, it is acceptable. It is acceptable and pleasing to God. Wait a minute. <laughs> when I suffer, does it please God? If your children are suffering in front of you, does that please you? The answer is no. But why does it please God? Because it's going to work for your benefit. Did you hear me? Because it's going to work for your benefit. 
And because it's going to work for your benefit, for your benefit, God says, that pleases me when they endure. When they endure, that pleases me when they endure. Because it's going to bring forth the right fruit in their life. Keep going. It's pleasing to God. For even to this you were called. Wait a minute. Was I called to suffer? <laughs> Is that what he called me for? Did he call me to suffer? Is that why we are called? It is inseparable from your vocation. For Christ also suffered for you. And he said, leaving you his personal example so that you should follow in his footsteps. Wait a minute. I thought he died for me so I don't have the pay, pay, to pay the price. Wait a minute, your salvation you don't work for. But living for God, it's going to cost you everything. Everything. But I'm not ready. You're not ready, not just to obey God, you're not ready to be blessed by God. Because there's a blessing in obedience. And there's a blessing in following what God says. But I'm not ready. You're not ready for anything. Not just the suffering. You're not also ready for the glory. If you're not ready for the suffering, listen to me carefully. You're not ready for the glory. But I want the glory. But the glory doesn't come without the suffering. Surely went quiet in the house today. I don't care. Did you hear me? I don't care. The word has to be preached. Because we've had enough of people living in the flesh and fighting in the flesh. Enough is enough. You're a child of God. Act like one. Act like one. Act like one. And stop making excuses for your carnality. Stop making excuses for your carnality. Which steps do I follow? Jesus' steps. He left us that example. Keep going. 22. He was guilty of no sin, neither was the seed or gall were found on his lips. Keep going, please. When he was reviled and insulted, Somebody reviled him and insulted him. He did not revile or offer insult in return. Oh, wait a minute. I thought I need to give them just a little piece of my mind. <laughs> they saying this and that. I should give them a piece of my mind. Is that following the example of Jesus when he was insulted? Couldn't Jesus open his mouth? Couldn't Jesus say anything? Couldn't Jesus ask the Father to help? Couldn't Jesus call on the angels to come and destroy everybody? He could have done all of that. And he said that himself. He said, I could, I could, I could ask my Father now and he will send me a host of angels right now to fight for me. I don't need your help. But why didn't he insult back? Somebody insulted you, you want to go and insult them back. Well, that's the right thing to do. No, it's not. No, it's not. How do you shut the devil's mouth? When they cannot find anything against you. They can make up stories. That's fine. You're free and you are not guilty. Doesn't matter what they say. When he reviled and insulted, he did not revile or offer insult in return. When he was abused and suffered, was Jesus abused and suffered? We don't talk about these things in the church. All we talk about is, you know, the glory and the blessing and this and that. The way to the glory and the blessing is what I'm telling you about today. A message that don't want to be heard today in our churches. 
This one gossip against that one. This one talk against this one. You talk against your leaders. You talk against those spiritual leaders that God placed in your life. You talk against them. You make, you make every excuse under the sun why you have the right to do what you do when in reality you're not acting like your master and you're not doing what is right. What did he do? He prayed. What should you do when you are insulted? What should you do when you are, you are not... Um, uh, you'd be mistreated or, or accused falsely or whatever it is. What should you do? Do what your master did. What did he do? Father, forgive them. They don't know what they are doing. Is that what you are praying? Is that what you are praying? I want to take vengeance of him. And if I heard something bad had to be done, good, they deserve that. That's a terrible spirit. That's not the heart of God. What well, I deserve that, it's not for you to say that. Pray for your enemies. It's not for you to say that. It's not for you to say that. He was abused and suffered. He made no threats. I'm going to show you. Oh, please. Oh, I'm going to do this to you. Please. You're not a disciple. You're not following your master. You show them nothing except the love of God. And you do nothing except treat them the way Jesus himself would treat his enemies. He gave a meal to Judas. Did you hear me? Ju Judas was sitting on the table eating with Jesus and, and the other disciples. And Jesus knew who the one's going to betray him. And he still allowed him to eat from his table. Are you acting like your master? Are you? Are you? I pray conviction by the Holy Spirit starting from myself. Because you cannot compromise, compromise the ways of God. And you cannot compromise the word of God. That's how it is. It's set up. He didn't do anything. He made no threats of vengeance. But he trusted himself and everything. What did he do to Peter when Peter denied him? Jesus knew that Peter's going to deny him. Jesus said before the cock crew three times, you're going to deny me. And of course, Peter said, you know, if everybody deny you, I will never. And Jesus said, it will happen. It will happen before tonight that when the, when the cock crew, you're going to deny me three times. But Jesus didn't say to Peter, you're going to deny me three times and it's finished with you. Did he say that? No. No, he said, I prayed for you that your faith will not fail. How do you pray for somebody that you know they are going to deny you? Jesus knew Peter was going to deny him. Jesus knew that Judas was going to betray him. He knew. But he said to Peter, Peter, I prayed for you that your faith will not fail. And when you are converted, strengthen your brethren. He didn't say, I condemn you. He didn't say, I judge you. He said, I prayed for you. I prayed for you. When was the last time you prayed for somebody that hurt you? When was the last time you prayed for somebody that doesn't deserve your love? Or whatever it is. And yet you say, Lord, Holy Spirit, please help me and use me. And then you went on your face and tears start to come down. The love of God for that person who harmed you or hurt you. He made no threats of vengeance, but he trusted himself and everything to him who judges fairly. Who did Jesus trust? The Father. He committed his life into the hand of the Father. He trusted him that the day will come 
I will put your enemies under your feet. And this is what happened to you when you submit yourself to God. God will put your enemies under your feet. You don't have to fight those battles. You have to follow the example of Jesus and show who you are and let God show himself strong on your behalf. Somebody give him glory in the house. Somebody give him glory in the house. Stand up with me, please, everybody. I haven't finished my topic on that. This is not the end of the story. This story, it continues to go on. Why? Because God is preparing you for a great destiny. Hardships prepares an ordinary person to an extraordinary life and destiny. How many of you, you want an extraordinary, supernatural power of God life? Keep your hands up and let the Lord see it. Doesn't matter who sees it. Let the Lord see those hands. Father in heaven, I pray right now for every person that put their hands up. Lord, I know these messages are preparation to what you have in mind and what you have in heart for every one of us, Lord God. The way to greatness is hardships and sufferings, oftentimes that is done unfairly to, every, to, to, to people. But God, you are the one. You said that vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. If your enemy hunger, feed him. This is the word of the Lord to you today. If your enemy hunger, feed him. Is the Holy Spirit telling you today, right now, even as I am speaking, that you need to go and do something for that particular person? Because if they wronged you and you mistreated them, it's time for you to fix it up and say, forgive me, Lord. I truly want to be a disciple of yours. I want to follow you, Jesus. Help me today in Jesus' name. And whatever the Lord is telling you right now in your heart, please, 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 when you leave these doors today, don't ignore his voice. Fix it up. Fix it up. Every eye closed. Keep your hands up. Thank you for this preparation, Lord. Thank you for these lessons. Thank you, Lord God, that you are amazing, God, that you are watching over us. And you are making us and preparing us for something big and great. I give you praise and glory for it. Help us, Jesus, to see and not to complain about what we go through in life. But just, but Lord, if we suffer unfairly, let us commit to the one that has look and, and rewards us fairly. I pray today that many hearts would repent before you. Now, this is not to pass any judgment on anyone. But ask the Lord to forgive you today. We've all acted in the flesh. We've all done things not right. Can I just lead you in a prayer of repentance today? Say with me, Jesus, please forgive me for my actions. My actions weren't right when I mistreated people, when I dishonored the people that you told me to honor them. I repent before you today. I'm asking for your forgiveness and the cleansing of the blood of Jesus Christ. To cleanse my thoughts, to cleanse my heart, to cleanse my life. I want to be ready. I want to follow your example. In the name of Jesus, thank you for loving me enough to speak to my heart and to cause me to change. In the name of Jesus, my desire is to glorify your name. My desire is to be one of your disciples. Help me to live the life. Help me to pay the price. Help me to go through. In the name of Jesus. 
Thank you for your great love for me. Thank you for your forgiveness. And thank you for your healing. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks for tuning in and we hope you enjoyed today's word. If you'd like to know more about what we believe, who Jesus is, and how you can know him too, head to our website, voicetothenations.com.au. And if you'd like some prayer, you can also head to our website, voicetothenations.com.au forward slash prayer requests. Have an amazing day and we hope you tune in again soon.